The Tom Woods Show, episode 742. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If you're a homeschooling parent and you're tired of running yourself ragged, then check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And check it out through my special link where you get three free bonuses totaling $160. My special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hello, Tom Woods here. We are doing something a little unusual today. I'm taking a, a listener of the show, in fact, a member of my Supporting Listeners program. You can join that elite group at supportinglisteners.com. Lots of goodies. You don't necessarily get on the show, but you do get a lot of goodies. And he's in that private Facebook group. And he wrote me a very nice note maybe about a week ago telling me about the transformation in his life that occurred after he started reading libertarian materials and including my own as well as listening to the show. And he's decided to resign his commission in the U.S. Army where he'd been an officer. And he had thought throughout his life as he was growing up this was the career he'd have. So it's quite quite a turnaround, quite a reversal for him to say, you know what, I, I can't do this. I'm going to have to do something completely different. So he was sending me just a nice thank you note, and I said, why don't you come on the show? Let's talk about it. I don't talk to enough of the listeners, and this is an interesting story, so let's talk about that. So we are indeed going to talk about that. I'm going to be linking to him where you can read his writing and stuff at tomwoods.com slash 742. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. I have received emails like yours in the past, and only this time did it occur to me, why don't I talk to this guy? I bet it would be an interesting story. So here we are talking about it. And, you know, for most of these conversations I have, I brief myself and I read the guest book and I do whatever. I do my background research. In this case, I know a little bit about you, but I thought it would be more interesting if I just asked you questions as somebody who doesn't know your experience and just let you tell it fresh. So let's start with your background. Are you actually from Kansas? Because I, I see you went to KU. Uh, I've lived, I grew up in Virginia, and then my dad, when I was 16, we moved all the way out to the western part of Kansas, which is even worse than Topeka, <laughs> uh, out near Dodge City. Okay. So uh, your discussion is about Topeka, and I understand completely. Lawrence is like the only jewel of Kansas. Yeah, I always liked Lawrence, yeah. Okay, so you spent some time there. At what point did you enter the military? Did you go to school first, or did you enter the, enter the military to, in order to get to school? I'd always wanted to be in the military for, for some reason, ever since I, I could remember. And uh, I joined the ROTC department at the University of Kansas, and they helped pay for my school. Uh, and I graduated from Kansas in 2002 and immediately went into active duty as a field artillery officer. Okay. So – how long then, how many years, because this will date you, I suppose, but how many years did you spend in the military? And I mean, you're still there, so you, you may want to make your statement. Oh, that's right. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that this is my own personally held beliefs, and I'm not a spokesman of the Department of Defense, nor am I being paid by the Department of Defense today uh, while we're doing the interview. All right, fair enough. I, I think everybody assumed that, but I know you have to say it, so I'm, I'm glad you did. What was your question again, Tom? How many years have you been in the military? I have 12 years. I had a little break in service uh, for about three years. I did five years of active duty. I did uh, 18 months in Korea, and I did 13 months in Afghanistan in 2005 and 2006 while I was a member of the active duty. And then I went into the National Guard in Virginia for two, two and a half years, left the Army, uh, came back in in 2012, and now I'm on the, in the process of resigning my commission. Okay, so let, let's go through those. What is it like being in Korea in the U.S. military? There isn't a whole lot going on, presumably. In Korea? No, it's mainly just go there and train, limited training time, uh, just because, you know, the Koreans do have a set limit on where the Americans can train, and they don't want us interfering with their their population. And so, you know, we mainly sp spent time on the base uh, and we could leave uh, during the day if we wanted to, if we had some free time, but we were expected to be back in the evening. So we had a curfew. Okay. So do you, when you look back on your experiences in Korea, these were not, this, this was not a time that formed you ideologically or anything. No, 
uh, I, I enjoyed myself over there. I had a really good time. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, meeting the Korean people and thought that they were uh, they're awesome. But Afghanistan, I suspect, might have been somewhat different. What were your experiences like there? Uh, I was a field artillery officer, and uh, I was in attached to a uh, special forces unit. So, you know, I got to see some uh, action, I guess, if you want to put it that way. And then eight months into my tour, I got promoted to captain. So they stuck me in Kandahar, and I got to see the innards of the Army, I guess. And uh, that's when I started to not necessarily change the way I think, but think about, you know, this isn't something I want to do for the rest of my life. And that was a catalyst for my conversion, I believe, just because I spent so much time over there. I'd spent time away from my from home. I'd spent time away from my family. My dad had a, uh, a mini stroke because of the stress of me being over there, uh, which I didn't find out until later. Uh, and that, that just started my that was the catalyst that got me thinking that the army is not everything that I wanted for my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you feel comfortable telling us the kinds of things that you saw that gave you, made you a little uncomfortable? It wasn't I, at that time. I wasn't uncomfortable with anything that I'd done. It was more of, I started being selfish with my time. You know, I didn't want to continually have my time and my life dictated to me like the army does. You know, the army's very structured. Uh, you know, I knew that they were, going to be more and more deployments coming up because this is in 2005 and 2006 when Iraq was starting to get uh, even more violent. And, I, you know, I just made a decision. And I met my wife. That My wife, meeting my wife was probably the catalyst that changed everything for me. You know, I met my wife when I came home and uh, they told me that there were going to be more deployments. And I'd spent 31 odd months outside of America, the United States and I hadn't had time to form a relationship, and I, I, that was just missing in my life. And so in order to make sure that relationship grew and blossomed, I knew I had to make a choice, either stay in the Army and, and, and let that be my wife or, you know, me, my wife, Emily, and let her be my wife. And I chose Emily. So let's go back to the beginning then. Your motivations to, uh, in terms of entering the military were probably similar to those of a lot of people your age. You thought that this is the honorable thing to do, that you're defending the country and there are people out there posing threats to the U.S., so what else could someone do? Is that a fair summary of your thought at the time? That is a, that's exactly what, you know, and plus, you know, it's sort of exciting, especially to an 18, 22-year-old male. You know, I, I was in the 82nd Airborne, so I got to jump out of airplanes and get paid to do it, and you just see, you know, you get to shoot, shoot big guns and you know, ride around tanks and it just, you know, where else do you get to do that as an 18 year old male? It's very um, visceral and very, you know, very exciting thing to do. Now, my impression so far is that if I were to ask you, did you encounter a lot of people in the military who had some doubts about any of it? The answer would be no. I would. That's accurate. And even to this day, it's still no. Now, now most of the people that I know, because I'm you know, I am a, I'm a major in the United States Army and uh, on part time. Uh, I still see most of the people, you know, oh, I'm just going to ride it out to the retirement or now it's more based off of the benefits they get, not off of the exciting things they do. Right, right. All right. So obviously, at some point, something happens to you. You start thinking differently. When is that and what is that catalyst? Well, Tom, I, I grew up in a Catholic household and uh, when I went to college, I, I strayed away from it. Uh, so I had a, a grounding in some Christian understanding, uh, limited Christian understanding. But my wife, we moved to Virginia, and she wanted to join a church. And I went to a church with her, and I said, sweetie, I, I can't go to this church with you. But I wanted to spend time with my wife. So I said, why don't we try to find a church that we can both go to? You know, I was just trying to, to please her. And uh, we found a, a non-denominational church in, in, in the Virginia Beach area. And uh, it just resonated with me, and I became a Christian. But I was still one of the, you know, in my belief, a typical American Christian these days where they, they believe in Jesus, but they would still believe in the military and, you know, foreign interventions, and they're pro-life except if it's anybody else but Americans. You know, then, you know, we can harm 18-year-olds or 16-year-olds that live in the Middle East or in Africa or Ukraine or Russia or where, wherever. And so that was— Becoming a Christian was the catalyst, and then I sort of, 
uh, I became a police officer and I started, you know, seeing that side of America because, you know, being a police officer is the next natural step for someone in the army, supposedly, is, oh, if you get out of the army, go become a police officer, you know, you get to have the same action you had in the military, but at home. And uh, that wasn't something that I started seeing the militarization and the just the interaction that a lot of police officers have with with people. And I was a revenue generator. And uh, that started getting me thinking. And I, I met another friend of mine who was who liked Ron Paul. So I started talking to him and then I started researching more and more about Ron Paul. And I found Lou Rockwell and then I found you and I, I read your books. And that was the catalyst that got me thinking about, you know, reevaluating my whole viewpoint as a Christian and as an American and, you know, what is the right role for us in the, in, in the world and the violence that we're committing. Wow. That that's okay. That's quite interesting. Now, can you try to explain to me and treat me like I'm seven years old on this? Cause I don't know anything about this, but I had a couple people on here, a husband and wife team actually. And they came on the show to talk about conscientious objection and how they were getting out of the military using the standard, steps that you follow and there are forms that need to be filled out testimonials and stuff of that nature and they were following that procedure to get out of the military why do they have to follow that procedure and you don't i've been blessed i have enough time in the military that uh i have 13 years in so when you first enter the army uh i had a a and everybody else and a lot of other officers seeing how i'm an officer i don't sign a contract every four or five or six years like the uh, enlisted non-commissioned officers do. So when I joined the Army, I had a four-year commitment because they paid for my school. And then I had a four-year, additional four-year commitment of it's called the Individual Ready Reserve. It's where they just stick you in there and then if a war starts, they can call you up out of it. And you retain your rank in there. Uh, you can even get promoted in the Individual Ready Reserve, even though you really don't have anything to do with it. So that it's a total of eight years commitment. So and you can do any combina you can do any combination of it. So if I did five years, so I had three years left on my individual ready reserve. So now that I've done thirteen years, I have no contractual obligations left with the United States Army. So with that being said, I can tender my unqualified resignation. It's like just going into a regular civilian job and saying, I quit. Except it takes a heck of a lot longer because everybody six or seven levels above me have to approve my getting out and they can disapprove it. And if they do disapprove it, then, you know, we'll take the next step, which I don't know what will be, but, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm a hundred percent positive I'm getting out. So, you know, I will take another step, but that's the reason why I listened to that episode. And it was an awesome episode. And that was the catalyst that really got me going to getting out. And um, I actually was supposed to go on a deployment with another unit, that I got out of, luckily, because I transferred units, but I was going to reach out to them. If they weren't going to approve my transfer, I was going to reach out to them and uh, help get help with becoming a conscientious objector. In your current capacity, does the public ever see you in uniform? They do. Do people come up and say thank you for your service? Yes, and it's, it's very embarrassing to me because I, I want to ask – I want to turn the question on them and say uh, – you know, what do you do? You know, are you a small business owner? Are you a janitor? Thank you for what you do, you know, because they're even more important because what I do is doesn't create anything. It just destroys. You know, I, I don't create anything in my job other than paperwork and memos. Well, that is that itself is an interesting response because it means that, of course, what you're going through now is extremely disorienting. You've you've gone through it a process of thinking that's taken you 180 degrees from where you expected to be in terms of what you're doing for a living and your overall thinking about the world. It's completely different now. And I can't imagine what it would be like to, as I'm a young man, imagine that I'm going to do such and such thing for a living, have hold that thing in very high esteem, and then get to a point where I say, I really just want to wash my hands of it. I, I, can you share what that experience has been like? It, it's it's been really empowering, and that's why I reached out to you, Tom, is because I just wanted to say thank you. I also reached out to Lou Rockwell and sent him a thank you email, and and Scott Horton, uh, just because you guys have have helped 
organize the thoughts in my head and and I just I've come to the realization that there, there are more important things in life about than what you actually what you do. And so the army was had was was my life at one time, but now it's just something that I I do and I don't want to do it anymore. You know, my family is the most important thing to me now and that's you know the most important thing. And so understanding that, you know, it, it's just a job. It's not who I am. It's just what I've done. And so and I can change what I do. And so I can't change my family and I know what I want to, but that's just been the grounding thought that's run through my head is that it's just something that I do and I can quit it and I want to quit it, especially if I don't, if it doesn't equate with my morals and my viewpoint on the world any longer. You said that going into domestic law enforcement is often a logical next step for people who are no longer in the military, but you don't want to do that. I, that's the impression I get. So what is it that you'd like to do? What's, what's, uh, what does the future hold for you? Well, actually, I, in 2011, I quit being a police officer uh, just because I started seeing that I was hurting people for voluntary transactions, you know, like we talk about, like you talk to many people about um, just the voluntary transactions. Like I would stop people for and smell marijuana and they'd want me to arrest them. And I was like, they weren't, they're not hurting anybody. It's their decision. Uh and uh, the, the biggest catalyst was is I stopped a family of four alongside the road one day for speeding. And the speeding ticket was going to be 200 bucks. And I, I saw that family. I saw the husband and the wife, and they were had their two kids in the back. And they weren't well-to-do, but they weren't poor. They weren't well-off. They're a typical middle-class family. And I, I just realized if I wrote this person a $200 ticket, it's, it's going to be revenue for the state. But what's it going to do to those kids? Are they going to go without shoes or new clothes or food? It's two hundred dollars is a lot of money to a lot of people, and at that point, I decided I was going to go back to school. And I started working with my wife and my father-in-law, who are small business owners, and I became the business manager for them. And now I'm currently training to become a paramedic because I feel I've always felt called to help people, and I thought the military was a way to do it, uh, and obviously it is not. Uh, then I thought law enforcement was a way to do it, and I didn't feel like I was helping anybody there. Uh, and I found medicine as to be a way to actually help people and actually see the results of your help. You know, you help somebody, especially as a paramedic in their, their worst times where they need the most help and you show up and intervene and, and help them, you know, see another day. And then, you know, that thinking about health and thinking of it in opposition to the military, that's exactly Ron Paul's way of thinking. Of course, we all know his, about his career in medicine and he often contrasts the two things. So it's interesting that you make that connection. You have a blog that you're starting. Is it premature for me to mention that? No. Uh, I'm actually going to try to document the the process of an unqualified resignation or my a resignation in the Army for others, too. So I know you've had the conscientious objectors, and they're an awesome resource. I've been to their website Um like I said, I was going to reach out to them and use them as a resource. Uh, and my thought for my blog is the, the blog about other viewpoints that I see, you know, about the whole thank you, thanking a veteran uh, concept, you know, that's in the future and a little bit more about my conversion and but and also about how to resign from the Army. Uh, I, don't, I don't see a lot of information out there, and it's not a top secret Thing. It's just I don't know if a lot of people have ever put it out there. So maybe it can help a, another libertarian or just someone else who wants to, to leave the military. Do you want to tell people the name of the blog? And then when you have more material, I'll, I'll give it another shout out later. But do you want to tell them? It's called The Appalachian Libertarian. Okay, .com. Dot com. All right. So I will I'll link to your blog also. Um, what did I leave out that you want to tell as part of your story? I would just say uh, my biggest thought is, is, I just wanted people to question how they, they see the world. You know, I, I saw the world in a very neocon conservative way for a long time. And by listening to someone else, I started investigating but because I questioned what I was doing and what I did and what I became is a way better person. And that's why I, once again, Dr. Woods, I've reached out to you just because I was so thankful because, you know, I, without your show and without, Ron Paul and, and Lou Rockwell, I, you know, I 
would have be- probably become a bitter, bitter man. And now I feel free and like I'm going to do something to make a change and, and, and help people help people rather than hurt people. And just just question your viewpoints and try to find the truth. What's been the response among your colleagues in the military? I actually had a surprising response. My my battalion commander, when I resigned from, when I told him I was resigning, you know, he sort of said he had an epiphany of, you know, what he wanted to do with his life. And uh, I have another friend there that he sees that he doesn't, he wants to get out, but he's caught, he's captured by the thought of a retirement. And, you know, so my thought was, is I'm not going to sacrifice any more of my time, which I don't, I can't buy more of. I'm not going to sacrifice time with my family. I'm not going to leave. I don't, and the, the fear of another deployment, you know, I, I got back in because I thought we were going to end the wars, but the wars have just kept going. And there, I have a feeling that not only are the wars going to keep going, but they're going to get worse. And I'm, I can't sacrifice any, a year of my life away from my two young daughters and my young son and my wife for something that I don't believe in. I don't believe we should be interfering with other people's lives in other countries and hurting them. Uh, you know, I can't abide by the fact that, you know, we may kill one terrorist in a drone strike, but 15 civilians are hurt or killed. You know, that, that, that's not a pro-life message, you know? Uh, and I just, I can't abide by that anymore. And some, some people understand it, and but for the majority of them, they're like, oh, well, you're giving up your retirement and health care and all this other stuff. And I said, but I'm not going to, you know, I tell them I'm not going to sell myself and my time for something that's, you know, temporary in this world. Well, I'm I'm grateful for your willingness to share your story on the, the show notes page is Tom slash 742. I'll link to your blog. I'm also going to link to the episode where I, we talked to the conscientious objectors and I'll link to the episode with Jim Hale who was a guy who had a transformation very similar to yours, and he had been involved in the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq with uh, Bill Crystal and some of those folks. And he just, just this year, just wiped his hands of it, turned around, and, and promotes the exact opposite of what he used to. So good resources to be found at tomwoods.com slash 742. Jason, thanks so much, and best of luck. Thank you, Tom. All right, that's going to do it. Remember, October 1st, 2016, you can see me in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's going to be a great event, and I'm I'm taking some supporting listeners to the Boston Escape Rooms, which which will be fun. I'm going to be doing one September 30th and October 1st, so I'm going to be escaping quite a bit over that weekend. So that's going to be fun. Then December 1st, speaking in Orlando, not far from where I live now. So you can get the details on those events if you happen to live in the area at tomwoods.com slash events. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.